What if I told you that this seemingly innocent expression holds one of the most beautiful secrets in number theory? Here's the challenge. Take in distinct primes, all bigger than three, and prove our number has at least four to the power of n divisors. The twist, we don't know what these specific primes are. This seems impossible. How can we count divisors without knowing the prime factorization? The solution involves one of the most elegant tricks in number theory. Plus, I'll show you a completely different approach at the end that will absolutely blow your mind. Our strategy will be to systematically construct a large family of divisors for our number. First, let's define our terms to simplify the notation. Let's call our number n to simplify the notation. Let k be this product of large primes. This will be our key variable. Now we can substitute k into our expression for n. This looks much cleaner. Now we can hunt for divisors. The secret weapon? Understanding that k is odd. Since all our primes are bigger than 3, they're all odd. The beautiful part? The product k stays odd too, which unlocks a powerful factorization rule. Here's the magic. When you raise numbers to an odd power and add them, there's always a hidden factorization waiting to be discovered. Since k is odd, we can apply this rule with a equals 2 and b equals 1. Boom! 3 must divide and we found our first divisor, but this is just the beginning. We need to scale this trick up dramatically. Here's where it gets really clever. We can apply this same trick to partial products of our primes. Instead of using all the primes at once, we can pick any subset S and let P sub S be the product of just those primes. Here's a crucial fact. Since our primes are all distinct, different subsets create different products. Moreover, a subset and its complement share no common prime factors, making them coprime. This guarantees our construction will work. We can split K into two pieces, P sub S times P sub S complement. Now watch what happens when we substitute this back into N. The exponent rules let us rewrite this in a much more useful form. Perfect. Now n has the form 2 to the power of p sub s raised to p sub s complement plus 1. The beautiful part, p sub s complement is still odd, so our factorization rule applies again. This means 2 to the power of p sub s plus 1 must divide n. We've found another whole family of divisors. Let's call these divisors C sub S to organize our newly discovered family. The distinctness proof is immediate. If two subsets S and T are different, their prime products P sub S and P sub T must be different, which forces the corresponding C sub S and C sub T divisors to be different. This gives us exactly two to the power of N distinct divisors, one for each subset. That's exponentially many divisors already, but we're just getting started. But wait, there's hidden structure here. These divisors aren't independent. They overlap in a beautiful, predictable way that we can exploit. Here's one of the most elegant results in number theory. For odd positive integers a and b, the greatest common divisor of 2 to the a plus 1 and 2 to the b plus 1 follows this beautiful pattern. In our situation, since all our exponents are odd, this means the overlap between any two divisors depends only on which primes they have in common. The greatest common divisor of C sub S and C sub T equals C of the intersection. This GCD structure gives us a beautiful divisibility hierarchy. C sub T divides C sub S if and only if T is a subset of S. This is the key insight that makes our recursive construction work perfectly. This structure lets us define new factors f sub s that are completely independent. The divisibility hierarchy guarantees these divisions always yield integers. Why are these divisions always integers? The divisibility hierarchy ensures that every c sub t for proper subsets t actually divides c sub s. This makes the recursive definition mathematically sound. For example, C of P sub 1 equals F, empty times F of P a sub 1. 
So f of p sub 1 is what's left of c of p sub 1 after we divide out the shared part. We can verify this construction is consistent. The payoff, n, equals the product of all f sub s factors, and they're completely independent. This is the key to counting divisors. We're almost there, but there's one crucial detail. We need to prove each f sub s is actually bigger than one. Enter Zygmundi's theorem, one of the most powerful tools in number theory. It guarantees that numbers of this form always have a primitive prime factor that's completely new. There's just one tiny exception. And this is exactly why the problem requires primes bigger than three. It's not arbitrary. It's a brilliant way to sidestep the one case where Zygmundi's theorem fails. Here's the precise argument. If we order our subsets by increasing p sub s values, Zygmundi guarantees each gets its own primitive prime that doesn't appear in any earlier factor. This ensures complete independence. Zygmundi guarantees each f sub s contains its own unique primitive prime factor. This makes every f sub s genuinely bigger than one and ensures their pairwise coprime. Here's the formal proof. Each f sub s inherits a primitive prime from its corresponding c sub s. Zygmundi's theorem ensures these primitive primes are completely distinct, making all the f sub s factors pairwise coprime. Now comes the final calculation. We need d of n, the number of divisors. Since our factors don't share any prime divisors, counting divisors becomes multiplication. So d of n equals the product of d of f sub s for each independent factor. Since each f sub s is bigger than one, it has at least two divisors. That's our lower bound. So d of f sub s is at least two for every s. Now we substitute this bound into our formula for d of n. Since each piece contributes at least two divisors, we multiply two by itself for every subset. How many subsets s are there? For n primes, there are exactly two to the power of n subsets. So d of n is at least two to the power of two to the power of n, an incredibly strong bound, far more than we need. We need d of n at least four to the power of n. Is our bound strong enough? Is two to the power of two to the power of n greater than or equal to four to the power of n? Let's rewrite four to the power of n in terms of powers of two since four equals two to the power of two. So four to the power of n equals two to the power of two n. Since the bases match, we just need two to the power of n greater than or equal to two n. The entire problem reduces to this beautiful question. Is two to the power of n at least two n? Absolutely. For all n greater than or equal to one, we have two to the power of n greater than or equal to two n. We've not just solved the problem, we've crushed it. Let's see this magic in action with n equals 1, using p1 equals 5. So n equals 2 to the power of 5 plus 1, which is 33. Does all our fancy machinery actually work? f empty equals c empty, which is 2 to the power of 1 plus 1 equals 3. Then, f sub 5 equals c sub 5 divided by f empty, which is 33 divided by 3 equals 11. Perfect. And equals f empty times f sub 5 equals 3 times 11 equals 33. Our abstract machinery works. So d of n equals d of 3 times. d of 11 equals 2 times 2 equals 4. This satisfies 4 to the power of 1, and the theory works perfectly. Ready for the mind-blowing alternative? Instead of factoring n, we can directly count how many different primes divide it. Here's a fundamental insight. The more different primes divide a number, the more divisors it must have. The relationship is exponential. Zygmundi's theorem guarantees each c sub s contributes a new prime to n. So omega of n, the number of distinct prime factors of n, is at least two to the power of n. 
since omega of n is at least 2 to the n, d of n must be at least 2 to the power of omega of n. This takes us right back to our super strong bound of 2 to the power of 2 to the n, which we know is greater than or equal to 4 to the n. Same result, completely different approach. As a final thought, why was that prime's greater than 3 condition so important? Let's see what happens if we violate it. Let's take the case of a single prime p, 1 equals 3. Our number n is 2 cubed plus 1, which is 9. The divisors of 9 are 1, 3, and 9. There are only 3 of them. The problem's formula would require at least 4 to the power 1, or 4 divisors. 3 is not greater than or equal to 4. The theorem fails completely. This isn't just a technicality. Zygmunti's theorem has exactly one exception, when m equals 3. Our entire proof structure depends on primitive primes existing, so we must avoid this exceptional case. The condition p sub i greater than 3 is mathematically essential, not arbitrary. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this deep dive into number theory, please like and subscribe for more mathematical adventures.